Yeah. So how many of you know that there's just people that are part of your life that are, are a bit harder to love than others? Right? You know, you, you, you have those people. I mean, it's common, right? These, these are the people that they, they push your buttons. They just have a way of kind of getting under your skin. It's, it's the people that just kind of, they, they tend to irritate, frustrate, you know, complicate, agitate, like all, all the kind of tates, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, they just, they just know how, how to do it. They, 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 they're clingy, they complain, they control, they criticize. And chances are, all of us have someone in our lives that if we're honest, they just drive us a little crazy. Right? They drive us crazy. We might even say that they, they drain the life out of us. Some of us, we're excited about the holidays, except we're going to be forced to hang out with people that we might not normally hang out with otherwise, right? The reality is that we haven't seen them since last year, but Christmas and Thanksgiving is going to force us to see them again this year, right? We know that to be true about our lives and the way that, that our lives work. And so today we want to kind of dive in to this brand new series that we're calling People Problems. And, and what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks together is just learning to deal with the people that drain the life out of you. Learning to deal with the people that drain the life out of you. Everybody has them. And what's so important for us to know is that, that people are a huge part of our lives. You've heard us say here that relationships are so very important, that you and I, we've been hardwired to be in relationships with other people. But there is nothing, let me hear, nothing, right? Let me tell you, nothing easy about relationships, right? Relationships are often difficult, yet our lives are always better when we're in relationships. But everybody has has somebody who's difficult, right? Everybody has somebody who's difficult. Some are endlessly needy. Maybe you've been there. Some you just can't trust because you just can't trust, right? Some are just seem to be a bit hypocritical. They say one thing and they obviously do another. They drain your joy. They drain your time. What do we do? How am I supposed to navigate those people? How am I supposed to deal with them? Because here's what I want you to understand. Those relationships are probably the people that you live with, Right? Just look straight ahead. Don't, don't look to the side, right? Like, like, you know, we're in church right now. Like, don't, don't just, just keep looking at me. You'll be safe, right? But you know who I'm talking about, right? You know that you, they're, they're people that are connected to you. They're not far from you. They're, they're, they're close to you in one way or another. Another way I want to say that is, and this is, I want you to hear this very clearly. It's sometimes, okay, it's those who matter the most to you that will ultimately affect you the most, it's those that matter most to you that will ultimately affect you the most. I want you to understand something upfront and important. If you're taking notes, this is going to be a huge statement that gonna, is going to carry us throughout this discussion on our relationships and the problem people in our lives. The relationships that we have are a combination of what we have created and what we've allowed. The relationships that you and I have are a combination of what we've created and what we've allowed. You have to think about that. Relationships are never one-sided. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not a relationship. You're floating solo, okay? Like, the reality is, is there's always two in the relationship, that every relationship you have, your marriage, your in-laws, your siblings, your boss, your coworkers, your friends, your children, they're always some kind of combination of the healthy patterns we create or the unhealthy patterns that we ultimately allow. We have to own that and accept that up front. When it comes to the problem people in our lives, there's usually two parts to the problem, right? There's the person's frustrating tendencies, and then there's your vulnerabilities to those. It's your, your reaction to those. And it's large part your reaction that gives you the problem that you do not desire. It's going to be a fun series. I'm going to tell you that right now. We got a lot to unpack over the next few weeks, right? And I think it's going to be good and it's going to be helpful to you. But today, to kind of start us off on this idea of people problems, I just want to kind of wade in, go into the deep and navigate dealing with people who tend to control you. Everybody probably has somebody in their life that at one point in time tries to manipulate you to get their way or tries to control you in a certain direction. I'm wondering how many of you would say, again, looking face forward, don't look at the person next to you, that you know that there is someone in your life that if they could control you or get you to do something else that you are not currently doing or more of something that they think that they need, they would absolutely do it. 
They would absolutely do it. That's just the way that they roll. There's, there's nothing new about the way that they roll. That what's interesting is this, this kind of idea, this kind of controlling, manipulating behavior has been a problem since the beginning. When you really think about it, you can go all the way back to the garden, right? And what do you see happening? You see a certain sense of control, right? You fast forward in the Old Testament and you read a story about two brothers named Jacob and Esau. <laughs> Just a little bit of manipulation, right? Just a little bit of control, right? Where the older brother has been out hunting all day and he comes home and his little brother has made an incredible amount of stew, right? But his brother says, I'll give you the stew if you just give me your inheritance, if you just give me your birthrights, right? That must have been some serious hangry moments, right? Because he does it and he's manipulated and then he's upset and then the story just gets crazy from there. Right? But then you fast forward even in, in the, the New Testament. Anybody uh, remember the story of, of Herod? Right? Like, like there's, there's Herod and there's these two women, right? And, and, and there's one woman who has a daughter named Herodias, right? And Herodias does a dance. And, 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 a, and apparently Herod is pretty fired up about it, right? And he says, I'll give you, it must have been some kind of dance. You know, I'm just saying, right? <laughs> you, you, gotta, you gotta read your Bible. You know what I'm saying? Like just read your Bible. It, but, but he does some kind of dance, right? She does some kind of dance and he says, I'll give you anything that you want. So she goes to her mom and says, well, what do we want? And they decide that they want John the Baptist to be killed. Now, Herod didn't want to kill John the Baptist, but these women had absolutely many reasons as to why they didn't like John the Baptist because John kept calling them out on their dirt, right? Like uh, on the sin that was present in their life. And so Herod had already given his word in front of people, and so he had no choice. He was manipulated into a bad situation that he never wanted to do. Perhaps one of the most fascinating and most interesting stories that I like, right, throughout Scripture is, 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 is found in the Old Testament, and it's actually a manipulation thing that happened with a guy named Samson and a woman named Delilah. Okay, Samson and Delilah. It's a fascinating story. If you don't know anything about it, it's found in the book of Judges, chapter 16. You ought to read that. I think it's so good. Samson was strong, right? He was dedicated. His power was somehow linked to his hair. He had long, flowing locks, and, and it was somehow linked to, to his hair. And, and his enemies, the Philistines, they wanted to know like, what was the secret to his strength. Well, he, he kind of fell in love with this girl named Delilah, who also was a prostitute, right? And, and as he, as he kind of falls in love with her, the Philistines kind of have her go on this covert ops mission, right, to try to find out what's the key to his strength. And she tries three separate times to find out, and guess what happens? He just keeps telling her lies, <laughs> right? Like, he just keeps telling her, like, oh, well, it was, this is the, the, my strength. And, and, then, and then nothing ever happens, right? They come in, they try to take over him. He beats him down. He moves on, victory, right? And until finally, it's interesting what happens, right? This doesn't stop. She keeps at him over and over and over again. And finally, Scripture says this in verse 15 of Judges, right, of Judges 16. Then Delilah pouted. I just think it's hilarious, right? Then Delilah pouted after three times and says, can you tell me, how can you tell me I love you when you don't share your secrets with me? Right? How many of you know that sometimes the most controlling people in your life, they'll pout, right? They'll stomp off. They'll do all kinds of, <laughs> you know, like all kinds of stuff to get your attention, to let you know just how unapproving they are of you, right? Like Delilah is pouting. Can, how can you tell me I love you when you don't share your secrets with me? And she tormented him. Get this. This is hilarious. She tormented him with her <laughs> nagging day after day after day, and I love, this is scripture, don't get mad at me, until he was sick to death of it, right? Anybody ever been in that kind of controlling situation, right? Anybody married in the room, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just saying, sometimes in marriages, right, it, 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 you know, you, you've been there, you've done, day after day, until you're just sick to death of it, and then what happens during that kind of control? Finally, finally, Samson's like, I'm just gonna share, just out here, I just, 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 just stop talking, like, just stop nagging, here. and what happens? He shares the secret. They come in, they take over him, He's imprisoned. He is tortured in prison. His eyes gouged out. Why? Because of this manipulation. Because of this control. That sometimes this control and this manipulation, if we lean into that, takes us far from anything that God intended for us. You got to think about this. In your relationships, it sounds funny because we all know that situation. We all know that person. We all know that moment that just leaves us feeling drained where, where Samson finally gives up and just says, I, I just, I'm better off dead. Like just, just like, just, I'm over this. 
And the problem is, unfortunately, we often allow people that, that sometimes are sometimes get this trying to hurt us, but most of the time actually really have our best interests at heart, or so they think. They actually really do love us, but they tend to corner us and they start to pull our strings to try to control us, right? And, and, and we end up surrendering the direction of our lives to someone else other than God. We surrender the direction of our life to someone other than God. So what do we do when we recognize that someone is trying to manipulate or control? I think recognition or even talking about awareness is key. That you got to look at the common tools to control. You got to identify how do people tend to control. It's more than just pouting and stopping and all kinds of stuff. But I think there's probably three common tools of control that all of us have seen, but we've kind of just ignored they're, they're so common that you just, you just don't really kind of just say, oh, wait, time out. I, I should be aware of that. Like, that's, that's a problem, right? So three common tools, if you're taking notes, is this. It's the flashes of flattery. Sometimes it's the flashes of flattery. People will tell you whatever they think that they can tell you to get you to do what they want you to do. They'll try to butter you up, right? Both sides of the biscuit, right? You know what I'm saying? Like try to butter you up, right? Try to get you, like sweeten the deal, whatever they can, right? They, they use all these compliments, all these kindness words, these kind words to try to get you to do something. And you know what this looks like when it doesn't relate to you because you have words for it. You say that person is a suck up. You say that person is a brown noser and you have reasons why, right? You say that person is a, and you have all these words that call attention to that kind of person, unless it relates to you. And then it kind of feels nice when people are saying nice things about you. And then it kind of feels good when people are trying to flatter you to get what you want. Or there's those people that they just tend to, to want to buy their way into your life. They're, they're, they'll shower you with gifts. They'll, they'll, they'll shower you with stuff until ultimately you feel like, oh, now I owe them something. That's a form of control. Oh, oh, now, now I owe them something. Here's what I want to say. Be careful about those who want to buy their way into your life because generosity never has any strings attached, Amen. right? Generosity never has any strings attached, but manipulation and control always comes with conditions. It always comes with a certain type of condition. Maybe, maybe, maybe you have those people in your life. I don't know if you've been there, but, but, but they, they just volunteer to do everything because they want to be appeared as the nice person. They just want to take control and they'll just do everything. And the reason why they do it is they want to do everything for everyone around them because they just want to see that things get done right. No? Just me? Okay. They just get done, get done right, not realizing how that kind of behavior actually belittles those and their contribution, you know, to, to the efforts that's going on around them. That sometimes it's, it's this flashes of flattery that make us feel like, oh, man, like it's just common tools of control. What about this? It's the intensity of intimidation. Anybody ever been there? This is why it's hard for you to have a conversation with your boss. This is why it's hard for you to talk with that person in your life that, that you know things aren't right, but yet there, there's this intensity of intimidation because the intimidator often likes to get loud, right? Likes to use a, a big, tough exterior, right? And, and an intimidator often uses threats to get what they want. They, they, they see things like, oh, well, well, do this or else, Right? Or, or, or don't do that because you're going to regret it if you do. They'll, they'll try to threaten you into a certain position that if you don't do what I want you to do, there's going to be somehow some negative consequence for you in the end. And they try to kill your confidence with, with those threats. They, that, that's why you hear in your relationships people say things like, hey, if, you do, if I don't get my way, then I'm leaving. If I don't get what I want, then I quit. If, 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 I, if I, I don't do this, then I will never, I'm not going to reciprocate anything on the back end. It's, it's your boss. It's, it's, your, it's your boyfriend. It's your spouse. Threats used to intimidate us. All the while, these intimidators are suffering underneath with their own insecurities. That's why they feel they need to threaten you so they can somehow maintain, maintain control of, of whatever they're insecure about in their own life. But if we don't have the conversation, we, we may we maintain control by these threats. They, they continue to exert their will on us. What about this? The go-to of guilt. Anybody ever been there? The, it's the go-to of guilt. Common tools that are used by those who want to control or manipulate a, a relationship. 
that, that a controlling person, whether intentionally or maybe inadvertently in many cases, they'll use guilt to control the situation to go their way. They'll, they'll use some kind of guilt. They'll, they'll say like, I, I thought I could count on you. What, do you. what do you mean the answer is no? I always thought that you would be there for me, right? And, and then you feel some, some kind of weird thing. Or they, or they say, no, 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 just, just go ahead. Just, just go on ahead without me. I'll just stay here forever <laughs> by myself. Like, like forever, right? Or, or, or they'll say things, you know, uh, after all I've done for you, you're going to do this to me after all, after all I've done for you. And here's the one that just kind of rubs me the wrong way every single time. Because usually, usually I, 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 can, I can see through the other ones, you know, that are guilt. But this one, and you call yourself a Christian? Who in Jesus' name, Lord, <laughs> help your boy because, right? Because they know the go-to of guilt, that there's a certain way that they can control the situation through this go-to of guilt. Now, you know what's so interesting about this, and I want to keep this in the forefront of our mind, is what's interesting is that when we, we're usually dealing with this idea of control, we're not dealing with another stranger. We're not dealing with a stranger or some enemy. Usually it's someone important in our life or someone that you care about who actually negatively affects your life in this way. It's, it's a parent, it's, it's a friend, right? It's a spouse, it's someone you're dating, it's your neighbor, it's extended family members. It's those that matter most to us that ultimately affect us. The problem people are usually the ones that we're closest to. In fact, there's one particular example in scripture that I want us to kind of unpack in our time together today that I think is really important. And at first you might not think, well, how is that really controlling or manipulating? But I just want you to think about it for a second. It's, it's a, a, a great story documented in both the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It was actually a turning point in the life of Jesus. Jesus was hanging out with his close buddies, right? This close inner circle of guys, right? The disciples. And he's, he begins explaining and opening up uh, about what he was, he's come to do. I mean, imagine Jesus's vulnerability, right? Imagine Jesus kind of opening up and sharing like, hey, now I'm going to tell you why I've come. And he takes his closest friends and he describes that he's, he's going he's gonna to give his life, that, that, that he's, going to, he's going to be killed on a cross, right? And that was just too much for them to handle, right? That was just too much for them to take in. In fact, this is in the, the book of, of Matthew. Uh, Matthew documents it this way. He says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. And here's the thing, that he's going to suffer many things, to which everybody's like, what? You're going to suffer, Jesus? Jesus, we've watched you work miracles. Jesus, we've watched you heal people. What do you mean you're going to suffer things? He says, I'm going to suffer things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. Now think about this for a second. These are all supposed to be good people. These are all supposed to be church people. These are all supposed to be like the elders, you know, the, the chief priests, like, like the teachers of the law. The, the, these aren't mean people. These aren't, aren't people that would, would kill somebody. I, I don't understand that. Jesus says, no, it's going to be this way. I must be killed, but on the third day be raised to new life. Now, now, just think about the context in which they're sitting in. You can imagine what them hearing this must have been like. You can imagine all the emotions that are going on because this is not the picture that they had in mind of someone who was claiming to be the Messiah. They had a totally different picture and understanding of what Jesus would do. They thought that Jesus would come and he would just take over power, that Jesus would kind of just strong arm his way, right? That this was going to be a government and political issue that Jesus was going to just restore and just fix just single-handedly. And then all of his buddies were going to be there and be like, yeah, we're the posse that's been together the whole time, what, right? Someone's going to sit on the right, someone's going to sit on the left, right? Like we get all these good things. We're going we're, we're to be with Jesus, but Jesus says, no, no, you, you, got, you got it all misunderstood. I, I'm going to be killed, but I'm going to be raised again on the third day. And then finally, one of my favorite guys in all scripture, right, like Peter, right? right? I mean, you know, we talk about Peter. P Peter, he's the outspoken one. He's the self-imposed spokesperson for the group, right? While everybody else is scratching their head, thinking about what Jesus just said, Peter always has to say something. You know what I'm saying? Like Peter always has to say something. And so Peter does something incredible. Peter took him, Jesus aside, and began to rebuke him. What? Jesus says, hey guys, I'm in a vulnerable moment. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to be killed, right? And I'm gonna give my life for you. Peter's, Jesus, come here for a second. Come here. 
Okay, uh, there'll be none of that, okay? <laughs> right? In fact, you just need to stop it right now, okay? You're bringing down the vibe, right? Like everything was good, right? Like we just had a nice dinner and here, here it is, right? Like, like you're killing the mood. Like you can't, what, what do you mean? He says, he begins to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this, this shall never, ever happen to you. Now pause for a second because I think this is something important to realize in those controlling relationships. What did Peter do? Peter took him aside. What do you mean? Yeah, P Peter, Peter took him aside. See, th those that are trying to control you in your life, they'll often seek to, to pull you aside, to try to isolate you, to get you disconnected from the group, right? They'll, they'll try to isolate you because they know that disconnected from the group, they have more power and control over you, right? I'm going to pull you aside. Hey, I'm not going to say this in front of everybody, Jesus, but I'm going to pull you. Just stop it. Like, like that, that's never going to, you know that Jesus, I know that Jesus, it's never going to happen to you. Now, now there's people in our life who will intentionally try to manipulate us and try to control us. Yet at the same time, there's a majority of us who are not dealing with bad people. Peter was not being a bad guy. Peter wasn't trying to like, 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 you know, be this mean person to Jesus. Peter actually loved Jesus. And Peter, he was just trying with the best of intentions to help Jesus say, no, we're going to be here with you. This will never, ever happen to you. But how many of you know that even the most controlling person in your life with the best intentions for your life can actually pull you away from the thing that God has for your life? Peter began to stand in the way of what God had called Jesus to do. And sometimes this happens in our life because the people that we deal with in our life, the only way that they've learned how to relate to their relationship is through control. The only way that they've learned how to arrive at what they feel that they need is through control. So Peter says, never, Lord, this can't happen. I'm not going to allow it. And Peter, even in his good intention, stands between God's will for Jesus's life. See, sometimes the problem people have nothing but good intentions, but even in their good intentions, it could be standing between us and what God wants from us. Now, what Jesus' response was was fascinating. Jesus turns to him and says, Peter, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> right? We think like, hey, think about Jesus. Like, yeah, P Peter's rebuking Jesus. Harsh words, Jesus, that'll never happen. He pauses, he says, I, I, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because you're a stumbling block to me. Now, now he wasn't calling Peter. Peter, Satan. So I'm not suggesting for the controller in your life <laughs> that when you identify that you say, stop it, Satan, right? <laughs> but Jesus is, see, Jesus is recognizing that this idea of control and manipulation, it's not something from God. You catching that? Control and manipulation is not something from God. God isn't trying to control you or manipulate you. God's giving you freedom to choose to follow, to choose to surrender. He's not forcing you to surrender. He, he is inviting you to surrender, to receive and experience something greater. Jesus is going to surrender his life. He's going to willingly give his life because it's what he's been called to do. And Peter tries to step up and manipulate the situation and direct Jesus somewhere else. And he says, no, Peter, I know this doesn't have much to do. You can't even understand. You got the best of intentions, but I'm going to tell you, devil, get behind me. Why? Because you're a stumbling block. You're a stumbling block to what you want to do. And a key statement, he says, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely what? Human concerns. How many of you know that sometimes there's people in our life that they're not even thinking about God's best for our life. They're just merely thinking about their best for your life, right? They're not thinking about what God might have in store for your life or what God wants to do in your life. They're just thinking about their own concerns for your life. And it might be well-meaning, but it just might be misplaced. Peter, he loves Jesus. He didn't want to hurt Jesus, but he did not want Jesus to do what he came to do. And Jesus pointed out something so incredibly important, that sometimes when we're not focused on our life with God, that when our relationship with God doesn't come first, then it's easy to be controlled and manipulated to someplace else, to relinquish control to something else through human concerns. Now, there's something also important that I think we have to realize in this, okay? Because every single controlling person has one thing in common. Every single controlling person has one thing in common. You ready? All right? They all have someone who will allow it. They all have someone who will allow it. 
Now, with that in mind and that, that understanding, I think that, 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 that if we know that control is not from God, that, that, that God has a plan for our life, but yet we, we're experiencing the, the people problems in our life, we, we, we know that there, there's issues and situations that we just can't navigate well in our life because it's just, it's just, it feels like, man, no matter what I do, they're just trying to control every situation. Then the question is, if I can see this happening in my life, how do I break free from control? How do I break out of this? How do I overcome the, the, the crazy of control? How do I, if, if, I, if I might be allowing it, in fact, even if I even created this dilemma, this problem, what can I do to move forward? I want to talk about three specific things today that I think are going to be incredibly helpful for us as we kind of overcome this crazy of control. And then I want to talk about a special person that I think should, should kind of resonate with all of us at the end. So I want you to hang in there for that. But at least take notes along the way because I think this will be helpful for you. Overcoming the crazy of control starts by recognizing the red flags of control. It starts by recognizing the red flags of control. Some of those common things that a control person does. And now some of you, you hear that and you're like, Really? That, that's what you got for us? Like you said, this is going to be helpful. Like that sounds pretty, pretty basic and actually seems kind of obvious. Well, well, let me help you with something this. It might often seem obvious to you, but it's not so obvious to the person who's grown up thinking that this pattern of behavior is normal. It's, it's, not, it's not so obvious to, to the person who is used to being controlled and doesn't even recognize that, that it's not only not normal, but that it's unhealthy for the relationship. That, that, that sometimes you and I, if we're not careful, we have functioned so long in our dysfunction that, that, that we, we don't even recognize our own dysfunction or that of another person. And so you have to slow down and you have to begin to look at the red flags of control, that, that we've got people that want to play us in our life and we'll go along for it if we, if we will allow it. But the key question is, well, what am I looking for then? If I'm going to look for the red flags of control, that, what, what am I looking for then? How about we start here? Maybe if you always feel guilty if you say no. The red flags of control. You always feel guilty if you say no. You, you feel this overwhelming weight to one person particular person or group. You have to have this exclusive loyalty and anything outside of that exclusive loyalty to that person or to that group is now viewed upon as like, you don't love me anymore. You don't want to hang out with me anymore. You don't like me anymore. Like, what, what, What's the deal with that? It means you can't have fun outside of that controlling person or that people problem in your life. Why? Because you feel obligated. You feel obligated. You, you, you would love to say no sometimes simply because you know that saying no is the best thing to do, but you feel like you can't. Why? Because you don't want to deal with the guilt that comes along with it. You, you don't want to deal with the frustration that will ensue. You always feel guilty if you say no. Or what about this? You, you tend to carry unnecessary responsibility. That a lot of times we tend to carry unnecessary responsibility. We assume that we have to be the one to always fix it. We assume that, that, that we're the one that has to step in because nobody else is going to do it like, like, like we're going to do it. We know that we're going to be the ones that, that, that do it right. In fact, if we don't do it, we have this genuine fear that we're going to let somebody down. Right? We take on this unnecessary responsibility. It's the belief that you're the only one that can solve their problems. And if you had been there and if you had done more than this situation, it wouldn't have been going on. It's a form of control to get you stuck in that moment, right? That you always feel guilty for saying no, you carry unnecessary responsibility. But what are some of the other red flags of control? This one's huge because I think it happens to a lot of us. You often compromise your values. A huge red flag of control is you often compromise your values. You ultimately compromise what you know to be true. You think you're doing it to keep things drama free or, or to keep the, the peace somehow. But the question I'm asking you is think about it. What have you at the end of the day compromised? I think some of us, if we're honest, we see that we've, we've compromised our integrity. We've compromised our reputation. We've compromised what God has put in our heart. And some of us compromise our values because we're so afraid of losing a certain person in our life. You've waited so long to be in that dating relationship, and now you're finally in that dating relationship. And now this person, they're being a little controlling and manipulative. They don't want you to do some things that you know aren't good for you. 
They want you to participate in some ways that you shouldn't be participating in. And you know it's not right, and you've tried to have the conversation, but they've controlled their way over it. And what you'll end up doing is you'll end up compromising your values to try to keep them happy. If you're willing to be controlled by those compromises, then it becomes incredibly difficult to commit to God and what he has for your life. Why? Because you've let someone else take control of your life through your compromised values, through, through knowing what you know to be true, through, through staying there. And the result is that when you compromise your values to someone, to someone that, that, that is trying to control you, you've now compromised your values to someone who loves themselves more than they actually love you. You ever thought about it that way? There's an incredible amount of selfishness that's synonymous with control. With control, this idea of of manipulation. So, so what is it that we, that we do? It's interesting that there's a lot of people that I talk to that when it comes to red flags, they always notice them in retrospect. They always notice them in retrospect. Like they, they, they look back and they say, you know, if I really think about it hard enough, I'm like, you don't have to think hard. <laughs> if you just observe, right? If, if you just acknowledge, if you just stay woke, <laughs> Right? Like, you would see, you would see, you would see that there's red flags. But here's what we do. We, we tend to ignore the red flags. We, we tend to downplay the red flags. We see that person in our life that we honestly believe that, that they, they mean well for us. They, they have good intentions for us. And because they do, we see the red flag, but, but we know they, they, they wouldn't be malicious like that. And they probably aren't trying to be malicious. But a red flag is a red flag, and a red flag is there for a reason. It's to caution you to say, hello, something is wrong. Something is not right. Just like we talked about last week as it relates to our mental health. Everything that we talked about last week actually pours right into our relationships with other people. We have to be aware of what's going on in our relationships. Why? Because it absolutely affects our spiritual health and our emotional health and ultimately our mental health. What if we can see the red flags from the start? What if we prayed and said, God, God, would you help me to recognize when someone is trying to manipulate me? God, I invite you into the situation. Help me to see the red flags from the start. Recognize the red flags. What what about this? Learn how to be responsive instead of reactive. You choose to learn how to be responsive instead of, instead of reactive. That, that, that sometimes, right, if we're not careful, right, we, we just want to wanna give in. We just, we just kind of cave. You, you don't even want to fight it. You, you don't even want to, I'm just going to react in this way. Some of you, instead of loving others well through this control and manipulation, what do you do? You react out of anger and you react out of frustration. Some of you, you don't do anything about it. And because you don't do anything about it, whether you believe it or not, if you don't learn how to respond well, you begin to act just like those who drain the life out of you. Right? You learn control from someone else who's been manipulated by control. We, we've, we, 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 we see a lot more and we learn a lot more from observation than we think. It affects our life unless we choose to do something about it. In other words, you're not responsible for the way that they act, but you're absolutely responsible for the way that you choose to respond. And how are we choosing to respond is is important. And the way in which we respond is incredibly important. And it has everything to do with knowing who you are in Christ. In other words, you have to understand something. You have to know what you are called to do. How am I going to choose to respond instead of react? I have to know what I'm called to do. How am I going to stand my ground and not cave in to the pressure of being controlled? I have to know what I'm called to do. And what's crazy about calling a lot of times is a lot of people think that calling is this big, giant thing. Like calling is this large, overwhelming, overarching, like, whoo, I'm supposed to sell everything and be a missionary in a faraway place. And that might be part of God's calling for your life. But I also think that God's call for your life is in the simple day-to-day task of learning how to love your spouse well. That that's what you're called to do. You're to lead your kids well. That's what you're called to do. You, you are to, to help your household function properly. That is what you are called to do. You have to clarify your calling. When you clarify your calling, you, you deal with much less confusion in your life. When you clarify your calling, you, do, you deal with much less control in your life. 
Your calling is simple. It's to love your wife. It's to lead your children. It's to, to study well, to be a good student. That when you clarify your calling, you'll keep from being distracted by what other people want from, from your life. And you'll choose to step into what God has given to you for your life. I love Jesus because Jesus was clear about his calling. He knew what he was called to do. No matter who tried to say what one way or the other, Jesus over and over again in lots of different ways would just continue to clarify his calling, right? Jesus, he would say, you know, I come to seek and save that was lost. Jesus said, I've come to serve and not to be served. I, I came to heal the sick. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but it's the sick. Jesus over and over again, he says, I've come to, for the broken, I've come for the hurting. I've come to lay down my life. Come to lay down my life. Peter, Peter, this is what I've come to do. I'm not going to let you stand in the way. I'm not going to let you be the stumbling block. Now, just think about this for a second. What if, if Jesus was explaining to Peter, and Peter's like, Jesus, never, that's going to happen. And Jesus, Jesus somehow was a little unclear on his calling. Or maybe somehow Jesus' identity was wrongly wrapped up in what Peter thought of him. Because sometimes our identity gets wrapped up in what other people think of us and what other people want from us, and we forget who we are in Christ. Well, what, what if Jesus was just a little bit codependent, right? And, and he needed, and he's like, okay, okay, well, you know, you know, Peter, maybe you're right. Maybe I don't have to do that. Okay, yeah, you know what, Peter, maybe I can just kind of hang out here with you guys. You, you know, I mean, that, that was going to be for the sins of the entire world, but, you know, I mean, they'll figure out something else, right? Like, that, 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 that'll be fine, Right? Like, like what, 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 if, what if his identity was wrongly wrapped up in what, what Peter thought of him? See, the thing is, Jesus, he was clear about his calling, and Jesus would never do that because the moment that Jesus gives control to someone else, that someone else is now directing his life, not God directing his life. We have to know this for us in our relationships. We have to understand this when it comes to our people problems. Clarify what you are called to do. I know this term is, well, so I'm just gonna say it this way. If, if, you're, if you're not currently dating someone, but you someday hope to, our culture calls that singleness. And I know you don't like that word, but you know what? Maybe right now God has you in a single moment so that he can teach you some things about who he is and what your identity is in him. And maybe your calling in that moment is just continue to live out your life, seeking God and his direction for your life, not to worry about who God's going to bring into your life, but to continue to find your identity and his direction for your life. Maybe that's what your next step is as a single person. For those of you in clarifying your calling that are dating, right? To clarify your calling as a dating couple would say that if God is first in our life, then we want to establish a God-honoring relationship, and the way that we establish a God-honoring relationship is not to do the things that we know God has reserved for marriage, right? Not to pretend our way through our relationship, but to honor God through our relationship so that we can stand before God and ask him to bless the future that we hope to have together. That we are called to live into that relationship with God first, right? Young married couples. If we've got some young married couples, I talk to a lot of young married couples. Here, here's what I want to say. Maybe God has called you in your life right now to recognize the control from outside sources around you, whether it's your friends, whether it's your parents, or whether it's your in-laws. Scripture is clear. You need to leave and cleave. Right? You need to leave and clean, which means that you love your parents. You, you, you can honor your parents, but the reality is, is they no longer control your home. Why? Because you and your spouse have established this covenant before God where you are now carving this territory as a husband and wife, building your family. Right? You are called to work that first, to be there, for, not to try to please your family, not to try to please your parents, right? And I know I'm stepping on some toes right now, but I'm going to do it for a little bit because I think it's important, right? We got to break free from some of the control because I got some parents in the room, right, that would love nothing more than to continue to control their kids. But listen, listen to what I'm saying. You're, you're, not, you're not called to control. I want, I want to clarify that. You're not called to give someone control. You're called to surrender your life to Jesus. So students, students in the room. We got students first Sunday. Students, you're in the room. Here, here's what I need you to understand and know, okay? One of the best ways that you can honor God and, and, and to live into all that he has created you to be is to honor and obey your parents. It's to honor and to obey your parents. Hear me clearly when I say that, to honor and to obey your parents. And with that, I get it. I know you're not always going to agree with them. I know sometimes things are going to be frustrating, but understand this. There is blessing in your obedience. 
There is blessing from your obedience. So learn to be obedient to your parents. Understand this, that even if you get frustrated with your parents and their decision-making, understand and know something. Your parents, right, they're accountable to God. They're accountable to God for the way that they parent you, the way they lead you, they, the way they, they help you. Now, parents, I'm going to talk to you too because this is a great opportunity to do this in people problem series, right? Because sometimes, parents, if we're not careful, we create more problems than we need to. So, so parents, listen, listen. One of the best ways you can honor God and love your kids is to stop trying to control their every move. Stop trying to control every, and, and listen to me clearly because I know it's going to start getting real uncomfortable. I, 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 I say this with love. I say this with respect. I say this as a fellow parent who is preaching to himself. Listen, stop trying to impose a will on them that does not benefit them because it only benefits you. You have to be aware of that. Sometimes you want what's best for them and you think you know what's best for them and you want them to have something that you didn't have, but you know what? Maybe you're standing in the way of what God has for them. And Jesus actually talked about that. He talked about that as it related to the Pharisees. He says, Pharisees, why are you tying these heavy, cumbersome loads on people that you yourself aren't even willing to carry? You're asking people to do things and function and be a certain way that you yourself won't even do. He says, you're setting a double standard and all you're trying to do is control people. Scripture says, don't provoke your children to wrath, okay? I guess a modern day translation would be, and again, with love, it would be parents, let's, let's, let's land the helicopter and instead let's begin to lead with great wisdom and compassion. Let us land the helicopter. God's not calling you to hover over your kids. Your, your kids don't need anybody hovering over them. Your kids are desperately crying out for someone to lead them well, to be an example, to take that next step, not to control the situation, but to lead them. Follow me as I follow God. The next last is just choose to redefine the relationship. Choose to redefine the relationship. If we're going to get over this control and this manipulation, then the reality is, is we're just going to need to redefine the relationship. I want you to ask yourself the question, what is your ultimate goal in life? No matter what, what stage of life that you're in right now, what is your ultimate goal in life? Galatians 1.10, something so fast. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Do I want to please everybody around me? Because let's, let's be honest, we all got a little people pleaser in all of us, Right? We get so caught up in wanting to please everybody around us, needing to be the most well-liked, needing to come through for everybody, be everything for everybody, and you can't do that. You can't control all that. Are you trying to please human beings? Or are you trying to please God, right? If I'm still trying to please people, then, then guess what he says? I couldn't be a servant of God. Why? Because if you're gonna allow people to control your life, they'll manage the direction of your life. And they'll manage the direction of your life away from what God has for your life. It's so important to recognize the manipulation of control. So what do we do in that? We draw the boundary lines. If you're going to redefine the relationship, you got to learn to draw the boundary lines. Draw the boundary lines. I'm choosing to draw the boundary lines. I'm choosing to draw a line in the sand. I'm choosing to say, you know what? I'm not going to do this anymore. Here's what I'm open to. Here's what I'm not open to because I know what I'm called to. Here's what I'm not willing to do anymore. I'm done with that. And I'm going to give you a fair warning. When you begin to draw the boundary lines, those that have had control and manipulation in your life for a long time, guess what? That's not going to feel good to them. That's going to be uncomfortable for them. And guess what? They're going to pout harder. They're going to yell louder. They're going to stomp bigger. They're going to do all that kind of stuff to try to tell you just how disapproving they are of you. But I'm telling you, continue to draw the boundary lines. You've got a choice to make. You either redefine the relationship or you continue to live being controlled. My suggestion is you begin to say to that person, look, this isn't going to work anymore. And you can pout, and you can hang up, and you can threaten, and you can walk away, but this is not going to work on me anymore. Why? Because this is so important. Listen, because if I let you control me, then I can't commit to what God has for me. I'm no longer willing to do that. Why? Why? Because God always has something greater. God always has something more. And that's going to be hard for them to hear. It's going to be hard for them to handle. It's, it's, they're going to be so frustrated with that. 
but redefine, redefine the relationship. Now, it's easy to, to spot those that are being controlled. It's easy to spot those people in your life that like to keep control. It's a lot harder to acknowledge and recognize that there's a little bit of control freak in all of us. There's a little bit of control freak in all of us. But we've said this before, control ultimately is an illusion. We don't have control of everything. God is the one who maintains control. And the minute that we try to control and squeeze, that we end up suffocating and killing something that God said is actually good and should bring life. One author says it this way, relationship isn't about ownership, it's about stewardship. And as soon as you write mine over something that is meant to be shared, then you crush its meaning and you kill its purpose. Wow. Wow. So what if we begin to recognize, I don't own those people in my life. God has entrusted them to me, to be in relationship with them. I don't own them. Yes, yes, yeah, I, I have friends. And yes, I have kids. And yes, I have family. But I don't own them. Instead, I choose to live open-handed with them. I choose to entrust them to actually the only one that actually paid a price for them and actually can claim ownership over them. I'm going to choose to trust the one that can deliver them out of darkness. I'm going to choose to trust the one that can set them free. I'm going to choose to trust the one that even though they're going in a direction that I wish they didn't go, he's going to be the only one that can change their heart and change their mind and redirect them to the better that he has for their life. I'm going to choose to surrender them to God in the very same phrase. As Jesus was talking about, you're a stumbling block, get behind me. He follows up this statement. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, must deny their own human concern, their own wants and desires, that you, you must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. To, to follow Jesus means that we surrender all to him. We surrender control to him. If you wanna follow me, you surrender your control to me. So here's our prayer this week as our worship team comes back out to lead us. Jesus, will you loving me show me the relationships where I'm taking something or allowing something in an unhealthy way? And will you give me the strength and courage to take steps towards healing and freedom? If, if my relationships are a combination of what I've created and what I've allowed, then Jesus, would, would you show me where that's happening and give me the courage to redefine the relationship. Give me the courage to surrender completely to you as I follow you. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. We love you. We worship you, God. We, we give you glory today for your goodness, for your grace. God, we thank you, God, that you have created relationship, created us to be in relationships. And sometimes they're hard. And sometimes they're difficult. And sometimes they come with all kinds of problems. But Lord, I pray, God, that through your wisdom that you would give us guidance, Lord, to, to make the changes next necessary. God, to, to begin to respond differently so that we can continue to honor you with our life. God, if somebody is trying to control us and manipulate us in a different direction, God, then we miss out your best for our life. So, Father, I pray that you would help us redirect. Give us courage. Give us boldness. And Father, for those of us that are dealing with control, may we surrender. Surrender our all to you. Surrender those people that we love to you. Surrender our wants and desires to you. And trust you with the outcomes. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, stand to your feet. Let's worship God.